Now, it has been announced that I would speak this evening about the I Ching. I should just say then briefly that the Book of Changes is thought to be the oldest of the great Chinese classics and to date from perhaps as early as 1300 BC. Although perhaps the figures of which this classic is a discussion may be much earlier than that, they may go back to the earliest phases of human thought because the I Ching really is the ground plan of the way in which the Chinese think and not only the Chinese. It's almost a mapping of the thinking processes of man. And it may surprise you to know that the system of arithmetic, which is used by digital computers, came from the I Ching. We have a binary system of arithmetic in which all numbers may be represented by zero and one in various arrangements. Is you is or is you ain't. So there's a sudden unexpected link between the most sophisticated mathematical machinery and a book originating at least 1300 BC. But what the I Ching really goes into is this question of is you is or is you ain't. It sounds terribly simple. Black or white. And we keep saying to people, you know, life isn't just black and white, or black or white. There are many shades of grey. True. But against some backgrounds, grey is dark. In another context, grey is light. And really, all colours, in fact all information whatsoever, can be translated into terms of yang and yin. For example, when you look at colour television, the signals are broadcast to your set as a stream of pulses. They could be put on magnetic tape in terms of an arrangement of pulses indicating either yes or no. This technique has reached such sophistication that with the aid of laser beams we can translate a physical object Let's take a complicated one. Let's take a dandelion flower gone to seed, a dandelion clock. You take a dandelion clock about so big, it can be turned into a formula, passed through channels, enlarged to any size, say this big, and with laser beams cut in solid plastic in a matter of moments. So that you can get this reproduction of a three-dimensional object. But the transition between the two was handled simply in terms of pulses. So likewise, the nervous system is so constituted that the neuron carrying a message either fires or does not fire. If it is fired, if it fires or if it's activated, that registers as a yes. If it is not fired, the absence of firing is represented as a no. And so you could say that all your perceptions, in all their variety and in all their color, are made up of a vast comp composite of little yeses and little noes in every conceivable variation. So out of these two, come everything.
Yang means the positive and yin the negative. Yang is identified with the south or sunny side of a mountain. Yin with the north or shady side. And note at this moment that you cannot have a one-sided mountain. Imagine it. And this then is the crucial thing that one must understand about the Yang Yin philosophy and it is represented in the symbol of a circle crossed with an S curve, one side of which is black and the other side is white. And so they're like two fishes. And in the head of the black fish is a white eye, and in the head of the white fish there is a black eye. These two sides are interdependent because the black one is outlined by the white one and the white one is outlined by the black one and they chase each other in the form which is really the double helix the pattern of the spiral nebulae and also the pattern of uh, love making between uh, many many kinds of creatures the spiral folding into itself Black chasing white, and white chasing black. Now, obviously, white and black are as different as different can be. When we say of someone that he's an awful liar and a con man, you say, why, he could prove to you that black was white. But strangely enough, black is white in a certain sense, and white is black. If you take the copulating word, is, to mean implies. Because black implies white, and white implies black. Or positive implies negative, and negative implies positive. Because you can't have the one without the other. So to put this into clear words, we can say explicitly black and white are different, but implicitly, that is to say by implication, they are one. So exoterically, outwardly, the positive and the negative of life are very different. Life is different from death, and good is different from evil. But esoterically, the secret is that they are one. As God says through the prophet Isaiah, I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light and create the darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. But that information is not normally handed out from the pulpit. <coughs> So we have to begin then seriously considering yang and yin, black and white. First of all, if I have a black background, somehow I am tempted to make a white mark on it. If I have a white background, I am tempted to put a black mark on it. Because if there were nothing to see but black, that would be tantamount to being blind, because there would be no difference. Nothing would matter, nothing would make a difference, so there wouldn't be anything. Likewise, if everything were white, it would be as good as being blind, for there would be no difference. It is only by contrast, when black and white are put together, that we know black as black and white as white. However now, when I look at a small white circle, or disc on a black background, or a small black disc on a white background, I at once get this in my thought, which is positive and which is negative? 
does black represent the negative because it's dark? Like night. But when I look at the black dot on the white background, I think the black dot is the thing there, so that must be positive. It was put on. And therefore the white represents negative because it suggests nothing. No mark, like white paper behind the print. Blank, blanche. The English blank and the French blanche, which means white, is the same. Blank, negative. Isn't this mysterious, you see, that both white and black can play the negative role? But then let's think of white as light. And it's playing the positive role. And when we think of black as the thing, the mark, then it's playing the positive role. See, both can play the negative and both can play the positive. But still, you can't have one without the other. I look at the black with the white dot. And I say, is that a white glowing sun in the night? Or is it a hole through a wall? In which case the black will be the thing and the white the absence. I look at the black dot on the white background and say, Yes, obviously the black dot is the thing, but on the other hand, it may be a picture of a white box with a hole in it. You see, they're reversible. Therefore, some reflections about these. It isn't easy for a human being, the way we've been trained, to notice that you can't have one without the other. Because our attention has difficulty in seeing both sides at once. You know that Gestalt image where you get two faces in profile and they are drawn as black silhouette. So you get two faces in profile about to kiss. But then look again and you notice the white ground between them and it is a cup, like a chalice. What have we got here? Kissing faces or chalice? People have difficulty in seeing both together. You must have one or the other. Either will do, but make your choice. It's like, are you going to be a boy or a girl? Either will do, but you have to choose one of them. And yet, bodhisattvas are always represented as hermaphrodite, as being, as it were, bisexual, transcending sexual differentiation. Because after all, everybody who exists is the result of a boy and a girl. Boys can't be boys without girls, and girls can't be girls without boys. They are very different. Et vive la différence. But um, by nature, by reason of their interdependence, they're one. Talking of the bees and the flowers, uh, where there are bees, there must be flowers. And where there are flowers, there must be bees or some sort of insect equivalent. And this implies that the bee and the flower are really one organism. The head of the body looks very different from the feet, just as the bee looks different from the flower. But a complete body requires both head and feet. So the head and the foot are obviously one organism. It's less obvious with the bee and the flower, but they are one organism. What is very difficult for us to see, however, is that solids are all of a piece with spaces. 
Now here comes the thing, you see. Take a situation in which we say of a given figure ground relationship that the black is the thing, the black letter on the white page. We say, yes, it's the black letter that's important. That's the thing. But supposing it's a white letter on a black page. Still, we say the letter's the thing. That's important. All right. So we say we look out in the sky at night and we see the stars and the planets. We say that's what's there. That's the thing. Around them is darkness and nothingness. Corresponding to the area of the magnetic tape which isn't magnetized, which delivers no message and therefore the message zero. But that, you see, does deliver a message. Absence speaks. Nothingness is important. But we are brought up, we are so brainwashed, we are so bamboozled, we are so hypnotized that we don't know that. That's the whole trick that we've played on ourselves. We don't know that nothing is something. And it's important. Lao Tzu put it this way. The usefulness of a vessel is not so much in the clay surround, but in the empty space in which something can be carried. The usefulness of a window is not so much in the frame as in the empty space through which light can be seen. It sounds odd and paradoxical and almost a little contradictory, but nevertheless, there it is. The space is, after all, not nothing. I had an argument with Buckminster Fuller about this, and he had to grant me that I was theoretically correct, because he said, so far as I'm concerned, space is just negative event, just negative event. The fallacy wasn't in the word negative event, that's a beautiful phrase. It was in the word just, only. As if space could be dismissed. And so in exactly the same way, when we don't recognize that side of life, people can play all kinds of tricks on us. The main trick is, I can scare you with death. You won't be, see? I can remove you. Wowie. You're going to get removed anyway one of these days, and you just won't be. Won't that be awful? That would be just terrible. You know, supposing you won't be, there will be nobody to realize how terrible it is. <laughs> But this is the thing, that this is one of the great tricks of life, and you have to be watching for this, as people use it, they, because they've all been taught to use it. It's really the fall of man, it was not to recognize the other side. So everything that we think of as nothing, space, empty space, death, sleep, uh, dissolution, decay, any sort of weakness, anything that goes against structure, that is, against the thing, that we think is bad, 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 and we're trying to get a world where that side of things is rendered impotent. Nothingness must no longer constitute a threat to somethingness. In other words, we want to play black and white and if we'll call white the light and the positive, white must win. That's the game we're trying to play. Not realizing that there cannot be winning without losing. If white must win, black must lose. But if black loses, we can congratulate black for having helped white to win. Because unless black loses, white won't win. You can translate this into the difficult and thorny question of race relations. How would you know you were free, white and 21? How could you be proud of being a white man unless you were a black man? 
you wouldn't know you were living on the right side of the tracks unless there were people living on the left side of the tracks <laughs> you know there's an IQ thing that says uh, up is to down as blank is to left or left is to blank you're supposed to fill in I would put taken. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> taken and left. Right and left, right and wrong. These opposites get tricky. But the point is, people are afraid of the negative one. Don't be negative power of positive thinking. That's all nonsense. The negative is the source of the positive. This is a f absolutely fundamental to the I Ching. This is why in the hexagrams of which is the, the I Ching is about 64 combinations of six black and white symbols actually they use an unbroken line for the positive and a broken line for the negative six such lines there are 64 combinations of groups of six or hexagrams and in all those there is not one bad one there is no sign of the aging which you can draw and the oracle tell you this is just plain bad because you can get to the very end of the night the blackest pitch black and it is precisely at that moment that the yang the positive element is reborn because you see the it is recognizing that energy is waves energy is pulsation now you can't have a pulse without a vibration it sounds if I go oh, that I'm making a something without a nothing. But actually, if you listen very closely to that sound, you'll hear you'll hear pulse. Because without that little chunk, which is a pulse, nothing happens. So this table, which is level and solid, and philosophers down it are always talking about tables, because they always have tables in front of them in classrooms. But here it's in solid. But this thing is going at a terrific clip inside it. And while we look at that, analyze, and we find that there are cellular structure in wood, analyze that molecules and when we find to our amazement if you take a molecule out of this table and it's about the size of my fist blow it up to that the next molecule will be why way over the other side of the room at that level of magnification so what's in the molecules atoms take an atom the size of my fist well the next one be somewhere in Los Angeles I mean you know, I'm just talking fancy shapes and figures. But anyway, a long way away. What's inside the atom? Ooh, electrons, protons, mesons, etc. And they, at the size of my fist, we don't even know if they're particles or waves, so it's difficult to talk about this, but they are a long, long way from each other. So we suddenly find that in this solid table, there's more space than there is anything solid. <laughs> there's a little bit of solid. But as you ferret it out and you go a step, step down, it's like approaching a limit. In mathematics, when you have a, a curve sweeping towards an axis, supposing it's an asymptotic curve, it's always getting nearer and nearer and nearer to that axis, but never actually collides with it. So we get nearer and nearer as we study substance. We get nearer and nearer to finally, what is the shell round the emptiness? We get nearer, we never quite catch it. Solid disappears into space, 
as at this level of magnification, the space has disappeared into the solid. See, if I just have one finger, or a better illustration, if I take a lighted cigarette in the dark, I've just got one point, but I whiz it around and you see a continuous circle. That's how you see a solid table. Because everything's going so fast that your eye can't catch the spaces between. Too little, too quick. So, looking at things from one point of view, we find a lot of emptiness. Looking at them from another point of view, we find a lot of solid. But what you have to realize is that the solid is based on the emptiness just as much as the emptiness is based on the solid. So don't be afraid of nothing. <laughs> it can't bite you. It's only something that can bite you. There's nothing to be afraid of in nothing. And yet, mysteriously, nothing is the source of something. It's like the womb and the, and the seed. So, yang and yin go together. But, through not seeing this, and the whole of our life is, as I said, geared to the thought that we might be able to make the yang side win. And so, in every sort of human enterprise, we are trying to have white without black. And this connects with what I was trying to get across this afternoon. When you talk about improving the world, you are meaning, presumably, that you want it more white than black. Or whichever one you call the good one. Maybe you think the black is the good. That's all right, makes sense. It makes slight difference. You know, which side are you going to take in the game of chess, the black or the white? Doesn't make much difference, except white gets first move. <laughs> no, I'll always wait to see what you're going to do. <laughs> we think, could we get rid of the other one? Now, as you know, in all matters of practical living, it never works. You think now, I've been miserable all this time because I haven't had enough money. I never know whether I can make the payments on the car. I never know whether, uh, you know, there's going to be sickness. And if only I had a little more money, I'd really feel great. So you get it. And in the transition from one stage to the other, whoops, you feel very elated. Of course, you feel elated. You're going up five thousand dollars a year. Say, it makes a difference. When you've gone up, then of course you're on a level again, and no longer do you have to worry about uh, making the payments. But you get a new worry. Supposing I get sick and die of it. Supposing uh, someone robs me, takes it away from me, worry about that. You say, oh, I'd feel so much happier if I had a medical examination. As you go to a fancy doctor, he says, I can't find anything wrong with you. But then all, always there might be burglars, so you get an alarm system and new locks, and finally you go to the homeless patrol and get a private guard to watch you, and that makes you feel better for a while, except then it begins to nag you. See, if I have that homeless patrol man out there, they'll know I've got something. Maybe I better have two men on the job. So, it grows. You worry. Because you found out that you didn't get yang without yin. You got a new yang, a bigger yang, instead of the former little one you have, but you got a big yin with it. <laughs> it's no joke getting rich. It implies a great deal of responsibility, and you've got more to worry about. 
don't envy rich people. It's a great mistake. Don't envy anyone. So, in the same way, uh, Zhuang Tzu puts it thus, he's Lao Tzu's successor. People who speak of having good government without its correlative misrule, or right without its correlative wrong, do not understand the basic principles of the universe. One might just as well speak of having yang without yin, and such people must be either knaves or fools. Of course, how would we know we were wise unless there were knaves and fools? But here it is, you see. You cannot beat the game. You can have the temporary illusion of winning, but by compensation you will ever so often have the temporary illusion of losing. When you go down a step, from yang to yin, you'll feel, I've lost something. When you go up a step from yin to yang, you'll feel I've gained something. How would you know gain without loss? How could you have the sensation of more unless in relation to the sensation less? For sensation is simply awareness of contrast. That's what life is. Now, if we realize that, we get the same feeling of frustration as I wanted to give you this afternoon in trying to make it clear that so far as the improvement of ourselves and of the world is concerned, there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. And this is simply another way of saying the same thing. You cannot have more yang than yin. You cannot play a game which is win and no lose, or a game in which everyone wins. You're stuck with it. Now, in just the same way, if we recognize that, applying yang and yin to all the possible situations of life, we get this awful feeling of, so what's the use? I mean, what do you expect me to do? Jump into the river and drown? Now, wait a minute. Why, at that point, do we get the feeling of, oh, what's the use? simply because we've found that our favorite game won't work. And we think that is the only thing for which there is any use, is the game in which white must win. But why not um, change them around? Isn't that a good game? Because you go why, 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 like this. Goes in and out. It's the undulation of a wave, the crest and the trough. You can go on a, you know, every kid likes a roller coaster ride. You go, it's great. So having both is the game. See, it's no game. That what we think is the game isn't a game at all. To win all the time. Win, win, win. That's no game. Because the game is always the hide and seek. Now you see it, now you don't. The game is the story in which the villain might win. And the whole idea of drama is to make it seem to the audience that it is, the villain absolutely must win. There's no way out. And then suddenly, for whom, the secret uh, thing is revealed and the hero wins. Or if you want a good cry, to have a tragedy and the villain wins. But don't you see? There is no vitality unless there's that negative element. The villain, the devil, the nothing, the death, the out. You've lost. Finish. Bye-bye. Quit. See, if that's not there, then the other one isn't there. And you're always winning. First thing you know, you sit at home with your wife and you play cribbage. Lots of married couples try to forget holy deadlock by playing games. <laughs> with them. 
And if one partner, be it wife or husband, always wins at cribbage, the game ceases to be of interest. Because every good player likes a sprightly opponent who sometimes wins. And wins just a little bit less than me, mind you, but he wins a great deal of the time. Yes, it's okay. He just a little bit. No. <laughs> so, if you don't have the unknown space, death, darkness, negative, you don't have the light. So the art of life consists rather in something else than trying to make white win. You didn't sit down and weep because somebody tells you you can't make white win all the time, forever and always, so that black doesn't exist. Because black by its very nature is darkness and it doesn't exist. You're trying to make it not exist. It's irrelevant. The very fact that it doesn't exist is its power. Non-existence is the necessary condition for existence. Just like you have to have a front before you can have a back. Or a back before you can have a front. They come into being together. So do existence and non-existence. So what are you afraid of? in trying to get rid of nothing which is already gotten rid of. So we think, hmm. But surely this is rather monotonous. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down, seesaw, life, death, life, death, life, death or birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. Isn't there some way of, I mean, must we play this game? It's like the game of one-upmanship I showed you earlier this afternoon. You can't get out of it. They're always playing it. And if you say, I won't play, it means I've got a more interesting game than yours. <laughs> Which is just the same game all over again. Would there be a way somehow to transcend black and white? So we've got black, and we got white. That makes it even. But isn't there something else? Couldn't there be a tertium quid? A uh, new, new possibility? So that we could have a three basis instead of a two basis? And somebody comes up and says, Ha! Huh, all right, you're black and white. A and B, you constitute the two ends of the base of a triangle. And I'm the apex. How about that? We we'll say, that's odd. Of course, it's odd because the first two were even. <laughs> I mean, when something happens, that's one and that's odd. See, it's odd that anything should have happened. It's very odd. It's queer. It would have been easier for there to be nothing. But then something happened. So then they said, that's odd. Then they recognized there was something and nothing. And then they said, all right, that's, that's right, we're even. So this third fellow comes along and says, now, what about it? And they say, you're odd. Oh, wait a minute. You stand over against us. So that makes two. We're even, and you're odd. All right, so that makes two out of three. Three equals two. Because we're together, we two. We recognize that we're black and white. You can't have one without the other, so we're together. And you say you want to be different, okay? <coughs> that makes black and white different from whatever you say you are, so we've got the new yang and yin. You can't get out of it. Make four, and it's the same all over again. Make five, it's the same all over again. This was how Leibniz reasoned, an arithmetic that could re represent any number using merely zero and one. Say, damn it. Can't we get out of this? Hey, what would it be if you were allowed five minutes with God and you're allowed to ask one question? What do you want to know? Because you know, you, you thought this over now, you know the, about the opposites, about the yang and the yin. And you know you can't ask God and say, Hey, Big Daddy, will you give me a tip to beat the game? <laughs> it won't work. What shall I ask God? 
So you can think of all the things you might ask for. You know, an electric guitar and a million dollars. And you know that wouldn't be the answer, because that would be Yang. There would be a big yin along with it somewhere. I, mean, I don't know what to ask. So you go in and say, God, beyond positive and negative, what is reality? And God says, my child, your question has no meaning. Oh dear, you thought, there it's gone. My one chance lost. <laughs> you think, you get a friend of yours and say, hey, look, you go in. <laughs> and tell me what he says. You ask him, what question should I ask you? He goes in and says, oh God, what question should I ask you? And God says, so you do want a problem. <laughs> well, you've got one. You thought it up. You wanted, a, you wanted a game in which white only wins. There's your problem. You made it up. You had to have that problem. Because otherwise, if you don't have a problem, you wouldn't know you were here. It's like, you can't be yourself without something you call other. How will you know you are you unless somebody else is somebody else altogether? In other words, the sensation of I here, living, sensitive, the lie, peeking out, beady-eyed out of my skin, entirely is it with reference to something over there, which isn't me. I don't know what it is, but it, it works all by itself, and this is pretty scared of it. And there it is. And I can't have this feeling without that feeling. So there's the same hocus pocus going on here. If I can't feel me without having other, that's the exoteric. Esoteric means I am the other. They're inseparable. How can you have self without other? How can there be other without self? You other on me and self on yourself. I self on me and other on you. But you can't, as it says, you can't have one without the other. Yang and yin. So in the same way, I say, well, um, this other, I'd like to manage it. I'd like to control it. Now, I know all these people around messing up my life. I don't want them to be that much other. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix you. Then I get on a power kick. And there are all kinds of power kicks, let me warn you. It's not just politics and economics and business. The worst power kicks are spiritual, like astrology. You'd like to know the future? Would you really? It's a power kick to know the future so that you can control it. No surprise. If you know the future, it's already past. But if you want to know something and to have knowledge, then there must be the unknown. Just as if you want self, you must have other. So the future is always the unknown. The past is the known. And what we witness as our present is the magical appearance of the known from the unknown. You know what's going to happen the next second. I mean, there might be another big earthquake right underneath us. Any, any minute now. Or the Russians might decide to release the A-bomb. Any minute, you would have a heart attack, drop dead. You don't know what's coming. Well, relax. <laughs> <laughs> they watch, watch, watch this thing happen. It's incredible. Just watch it. You, it, self, other, it's this vibration going on. But you think also now, wait a minute. Self and other, that means voluntary versus involuntary. What I do and what happens to me. Now, what do I do? Well, I walk, I think, I talk, I move my hands. I can be nice to you or nasty to you. I would regard both as my doing. But what about my... Um, blood circulation. 
I normally think that that happens to me. I mean, if my heart would stop, I wouldn't say I'd done it. I would have said that it, it happened to me. But Buddhists will say, your heart stopped, that was your karma. And karma means nothing else except doing. It's your doing that your heart stopped. You know, that doesn't mean, don't take it literally in a superstitious way that because you um, spat in someone's face in a past life, you're having heart failure as a punishment for it this time around. The universe is not geared to be a kind of judicial system. Uh, I mean, a lot of priests figure it that way in order to frighten people. But karma means simply, if you die in a plane crash or have a heart attack, it's your doing. But that simply means you've got to rethink what you mean by doing. Now, I've already proved to you that black is white. So now I'm going on to prove to you that what you do is what happens to you. And what happens to you is what you do. Because you can't tell the difference between doing. You can't tell what you mean by doing unless something happens to you to contrast it with, and vice versa. You can't say of something that happens to you unless it feels different from something you do. Now let's take a look at our breath. Are you doing it, or does it happen to you? If we do breathing exercise, you can feel I'm doing it. Just I'm breathing in just as I might raise my hand. But after a while I breathe out. I feel I'm breathing out. And I can forget all about it, and it goes on. And it happens to me. That's why in yoga, which means, yoga means union, joining, same as the Latin, yungere. Why in yoga you breathe? Breathing is the main thing in yoga. Because it's to teach you that there's no difference between what you do and what happens to you. You learn that through breathing. You can make the, the very best breath. See, we get into Christian terms here. The Holy Spirit, spirit means breath. See? Spiritus in Latin, pneuma in Greek, ruach in Hebrew. Breath. Now, there's ordinary breath. When you, you know, most people's normal breathing. Or um, fourth breath, when, uh, or, you know, when people try to sing and their, their voice is forced. But then the next breath is called Holy Spirit, Holy Breath. That's when the breath is no longer forced, it happens. When it's Nirvana breath, blow out, same thing as Holy Spirit. And then that, you see, the, that unforced one. You go on and on. So, that's why when monks chant, or devotees of any kind chant. They have the idea that I am a flute and the breath, the prana, the spiritus of the divine flows through it. It's what chanting is all about. Make yourself a tube for the divine wind. But that also means realize the unity of the voluntary and the involuntary. That's really what's meant by doing the will of God. Do the will. It's um, one reason why we get confused in English as to whether we mean will or whether we mean shall. I will drown and no one shall save me. <laughs> so, think, behind what you call voluntary, you decide. Having reviewed the evidence, I have decided it would be best to buy this brand of detergent. You made a decision. How did you make a decision? 
Well, I reviewed the evidence, I added up the price, and I came to the conclusion. Yeah, I know, I know all that. But how did you work the machinery? The computer in your head? You know, you pushed all these buttons, but what's underneath the buttons? Oh, I don't know. I never looked. So you see that involuntary growth called the brain underli underlies your voluntary decision. Because you, when you decide, you don't first decide to decide and decide to decide to decide. You just decide. But that means there's something else behind it. Well, you think that's terrible because if what I do happens to me and it isn't really doing at all, then I'm in a fatalistic scene. Yes, but I said, on the other hand, what happens to you is what you do. It works equally that way. You know, you have an earthquake. And the thoughts in your head drift about like clouds in the sky. But you can't do anything. So in the same way, this whole strain, the futility of the strain to make white wind and to improve the world, that entire futility, the frustration of it is what you mean by I. Now it goes. It won't work and the I collapses. Everybody is terrified of this happening. Suddenly finding out that you don't have an ego. Heaven preserve me from that, because I've been building up this personality of mine all these years. I've been very carefully nurtured, this personality. You tell me it doesn't exist? No, because your personality is a phantom even more insubstantial than your body. Personality is a work of art. It's like music, which vanishes as soon as it's played. <laughs>